national marine sanctuaries are, are um, unique, actually, in the federal government. They're, they're more like a national forest than a national park, I like to say, because national forests allow all kinds of uses to occur, uh, but under an umbrella of resource protection. We have a mission and vision statement. Our vision is a thriving sanctuary system that protects our nation's underwater treasures and inspires momentum for a healthy ocean. And our mission is to protect these treasured places in the ocean and Great Lakes. Next slide, please, Nicole. So we're actually part of a huge system of national marine sanctuaries. I say huge in a sense of the amount of square miles that are covered by national marine sanctuaries and national marine monuments, over 620,000 square miles of ocean is protected by the national marine sanctuary system. That's more than all of our national parks, all of our national forests combined and then some. So you can see we have national marine sanctuaries on the East Coast and the Great Lakes and the Gulf of Mexico, all along the West Coast and out into the South Pacific. Next. And we carry out diverse programs. Uh, resource protection is really the focus of our program, but we also do maritime heritage that's celebrating and highlighting our maritime resources, shipwrecks, lighthouses, our maritime culture. Uh, we do lots of science. That's really the backbone of, of what we do and how we are informed about management is through research and monitoring and a lot of partners with other researchers to do that work. Um, we do a lot of education and outreach, whether that's through our visitor centers or through coastal signage or special events, video products, uh, a lot of education and outreach to inspire and inform people about ocean conservation and marine sanctuaries. Uh, and we do all this work with lots of volunteers. We really can't do what we do without volunteers. Um, and, you know, I would throw in there also our sanctuary advisory councils, which are made up of volunteers that represent different sectors um, in the marine sanctuary. Uh, we do work on water quality typically, especially in these sanctuaries where we have a land sea connection. Um, and we do a lot with community partnerships and foundations to implement work. Uh, and really something more recent in the last 10 or 15 years is promoting sustainable recreation and tourism because we want folks to come um, see these places, enjoy these places, but do so uh, in a respectful and responsible manner. The next slide, please. So a little history here on this proposed sanctuary, this idea for a national marine sanctuary on this coast really goes all the way back to the early 1980s when the state of California and the county of San Luis Obispo proposed a new national marine sanctuary off Morro Bay in northern Santa Barbara County. And that essentially stayed on a list that NOAA sanctuaries held of lots of places across the country um, that were seeking designation. And we were slowly but surely ticking those off um, over the span of many years. The last one that occurred in California, of course, was Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in 1992. In uh, 2014, we scrapped the old system of a nomination process and, and changed it to more of a grassroots community-based process. Uh, we wanted to hear from communities about where they thought there was a need for a national marine sanctuary and, and if they could meet these different criteria that we had about national significance and, and other things like broad-based support, then we would accept that nomination into an inventory Again, another list of potential sanctuaries to be designated one day. So shortly after that change in 2014, we heard from the Northern Chumash Tribal Council, Sierra Club, Surfrider, and others on the Central Coast about a need for a sanctuary there, again, to re resurface this um, old idea, uh, becoming a new idea. Um, that nomination was submitted, and we accepted that nomination. Um, and then we're required for a nomination that sits in our inventory for five years to do a review of that nomination. We did that in 2020, uh, decided to retain the nomination in inventory, and then we got the green light, as many of you know, in November of 2021 to initiate designation and the, the process for designating. So next. So yeah, more on the process. Um, you know, we had a long scoping period when we initiated the designation process. It ran uh, through the end of January 2022. 
since then, uh, really, we've been focused on reviewing those comments, um, holding workshops, lots of meetings with stakeholders, uh, consulting with federal agencies, uh, tribal governments and tribal groups. Um, and we did all that work to create these designation documents, which I'll go into in just a minute. But that was released on August 24th and 25th, open to the public now for a public comment period. That's what we're in right now. That public comment period ends on October 25th. Once we close that period, we will huddle up internally, go through what we expect to be thousands and thousands of comments, um, review those comments, bend them by topical area, issue area, because we want to do a, a response document to those comments, not individually, but as groups of comments. Um, we'll consider the necessary changes that we need to make uh, to the designation documents, uh, conduct more consultations with agencies, uh, tribes, and interested parties. And then our target is still, we're laser focused on this, is um, by mid-2024, a final decision to designate and publish final designation documents. So hopefully by mid-summer 2024, uh, we'll have a final decision to designate. Next. So what's the proposed action? It's simply to designate a new national reef sanctuary in the coastal and offshore waters of Central California to manage and increase protection of nationally significant biological, cultural, historical resources through a regulatory and non-regulatory framework. It's meant to guide comprehensive ecosystem-based and community-based management to address a myriad of threats to these issues, to these resources. Um, and to recognize and aid public awareness of indigenous tribal heritage and culture, incorporate traditional ecological knowledge and facilitate tribal collaborative management. Next. So many of you know this map well by now. Uh, this is the agency preferred alternative and it's just that. It is an agency preferred alternative is not a final decision. Uh, this boundary essentially uh, from the north starts at around Montana de Oro State Park at Hazard Reef, extends southward along uh, San Luis Obispo County and turns the corner at Point Conception and extends along the Gaviota Coast uh, into northern Santa Barbara County. Um, this little extension from the original proposed uh, sanctuary along the Gaviota Coast uh, was meant to incorporate some state marine protected areas and some important Chumash village sites along that stretch of coast. And I'll get into more about why uh, in the next slide we have this gap between the southern boundary of Monterey Bay Sanctuary um, along the Cayucos Moro Bay coast. So next slide please. So what are the reasons for this agency preferred alternative? You know, I'll just say, you know, sanctuaries um, have a very challenging job in balancing lots of issues, lots of viewpoints, lots of stakeholder interests, whether it's from energy development, uh, ports and harbors, commercial fishing, um, it, it, all kinds of DOD activities, you name it. Um, and it's, it's tricky uh, to come up with a way to balance um, all these while also keeping in mind what is a manageable area for sanctuary management. So there are three primary reasons for the agency preferred alternative with that in mind. Uh, one was to be able to focus management on core areas and resources requiring conservation. The Santa Lucia Bank and some of these really amazing unique features offshore, including the Rodriguez Seamount and Arguello Canyon. These are really important offshore features as well as really important uh, nearshore reefs and kelp forests sandy and rocky shorelines, shipwrecks, paleo shorelines, and resources important to tribes and indigenous communities. Um, this map, this alternative also tries to address uh, construction impacts from laying up to 30 subsea electrical transmission cables from the Morro Bay Wind Energy Area to Morro Bay, which may be just too substantial amount of industrial development to occur within a national marine sanctuary. So, this gap is not meant to accommodate or allow for cables as much as it is the incongruousness of that amount of development within a national marine sanctuary. Um, and the other main reason was it helps ameliorate the substantial issues raised by Salinan tribal bands regarding the name Chumash 
especially in this coast from uh, essentially Los Osos north to Cambria. It's not a perfect match again with historical homeland, but it was our attempt to provide some balance and listening to all tribal interests. Chumash saying this has to be named Chumash and the Slenin saying this cannot be named Chumash, especially in this area. So next slide, please. So we uh, have proposed regulations. They're very similar to what you see in other California National Marine Sanctuaries. Uh, our sanctuaries in California. Essentially, um, our regulations say that all activities are allowed unless there are sanctuary regulations that prohibit them. So we have proposed prohibitions or, or regulations, like I said, similar to other California sanctuaries, and they do include exceptions to the prohibited activities. For example, um, you know, the prohibition against discharge. Well, that's true for everybody. U.S. Coast Guard gets uh, an exception for that because of their vessels. Um, and there's also a, a regulation prohibiting disturbing the seafloor that could include anchoring, um, but we allow anchoring because that's very important for vessel safety. Um, we have a standard permitting. That's just a couple of examples. We have a standard permitting process uh, that we're considering here to allow know to consider permitting activities through general permits, special use permits, um, authorizations, which essentially we can authorize another state or federal or local ballot permit. And then at the time of designation, we can actually certify existing permits. So essentially grandfathering in existing activities that have ballot permits. Um, this permitting structure would allow for permit permitting subsea transmission cables to shore as long as we can make a finding that has not significant impacts. We've done that, especially with transoceanic fiber optic cables in the past. So we have experience with permitting cables to shore. Um, there is a standard exemption we give to Department of Defense for national security reasons um, to essentially exempt their existing activities, but we put in place a process to work with them on any new activities that may uh, harm sanctuary resources. Um, and we are not including proposing any fishing regulations. Next slide, please. So we have a draft management plan. Uh, that's one of the three designation documents, the draft EIS, the draft management plan, and draft proposed rule, which is the regulations. The management plan is all of our non-regulatory programmatic work. That's really the, the what's the day-to-day -day work of the sanctuary. This guides sanctuary staff, the advisory council, um, and partners and what what is what are the activities that we are undertaking so there are 11 action plans you can see here on this slide uh, each one of these action plans has goals and strategies and specific activities um, and it also includes a framework that we co-developed with tribes and indigenous groups on at least a starting point for tribal collaborative management and there's much more work to be done there um, but we feel like it's in a it's a good place to get started um, and what's unique here is that this will be the first sanctuary that, you know, intentionally, strategically on day one has a framework for tribal collaborative management in it. Um, I will say that the management plan overall is reflective of a new sanctuary. So when you read these action plans, it reads as if we're starting from scratch. We're building programs over time. We're investigating issues. Um, we're creating the structure the partnerships around implementing actions around these action plans. So just wanted to make that, we're not gonna start off with a big staff, uh, most likely that you see um, at other sanctuaries. And I say big, it's modestly big. Uh, next slide, please. So like I said, we developed a draft environmental impact statement. This is a requirement under NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. We're required to evaluate how the proposed sanctuary would affect not only natural resources, but the human uses and activities that occur. So we evaluated how this would affect those things on boundaries using, you know, our thoughts on boundaries, regulations and management. We analyzed a range of spatial alternatives, boundaries. So we looked at a bigger boundaries. We looked at smaller boundaries. Um, and through that, all that work and analyze, analyzing, um, we identified an agency preferred alternative. We had cooperating agencies 
where we lacked certain expertise uh, to give us their information, their best information, what we, we should consider. That was from BOEM, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, their sister agency, BESI, their Bureau of Safety, Environment and Enforcement, uh, the Department of Defense, and the one federally recognized tribe in this area, the San Inez Band of Chumash Indians, where we have a special requirement for sovereign Indian nations to do government to government consultation. Uh, we made some key findings uh, in this draft EIS. I encourage everyone to read it. Maybe not all 400 and some odd pages, but you know, zero in on the areas that you're most interested in. But I'll summarize here that the key findings were that there were no significant adverse impacts expected under any boundary alternative, that there are significant long-term beneficial impacts for many of the alternatives and that the agency preferred alternative would have significant beneficial impacts on physical resources, cultural heritage and maritime heritage resources. And the agency preferred alternative would lessen adverse, but not significant impacts on offshore energy and marine transportation. So if you want to dig in more on that, I suggest you uh, dig into the draft EIS. Uh, next slide, please. So regarding a final designation, if a decision is made to complete the designation or final release, NOAA will review and develop responses to comments. That's what we'll be working on as soon as the comment period close, closes. We'll look at revising and finalizing regulations and management plan activities. Uh, we may need a change of the name for the sanctuary. We may need to change the boundaries for this sanctuary. So getting from draft to final is another key hurdle and challenge in this whole process. We'll produce a final rule, the final set of regulations, the final management plan and final environmental analysis. We'll have to finalize uh, agency consultations that will include a federal consistency determination from the California Coastal Commission for, uh, for that requirement. And we have a very ambitious schedule, approximately a six to nine month period once the public comment period closes. Um, Congress has the opportunity to review when we're ready at the final stages. And also the governor has the, uh, an opportunity to review and concur uh, with the state waters portions of the proposed sanctuary. And again, the present target is to finalize by mid 2024. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we had various ways to submit comments. We did three comment meetings. This is obviously the third and final in virtual. We had person in person meetings uh, at the end of September. Um, and next slide, please. There's also a way to submit electronically. This is the preferred method so that we can get word for word the comments. This is a, a portal, the docket through the federal e rulemaking portal at regulations.gov. You can see the docket number there, but you can always just simply search for Chumash uh, and that'll usually take you right there. Uh, you click the comment icon and complete the required fields and then enter or attach your comments. And then next slide, please. There's also the third old fashioned method. You just send me a letter um, and we will upload mailed comments to regulations.gov for you. Um, next slide, please. So that's it with the presentation. We're not taking Q and A on the presentation. Um, we want to get right into public comment because we know there's a lot of folks that want to provide comment. Uh, but if you have any questions, um, you can always contact me, paul.michelle at noaa.gov. And with that, thank you for your attention. And I will throw it back to Nicole to help us facilitate the public comment period of this afternoon's meeting. Thanks again. Great, thank you, Paul. So yes, as Paul mentioned, this is the purpose of today's call is really to hear from you, uh, hear your oral public comment. Um, so we are not doing question and answer, but as Paul said, he just gave his email address. As you can see also at the bottom of this slide, we did create an email specific to this particular effort. And so you are also welcome to go ahead and send any questions you have on the presentation Paul just gave on anything related to the proposed National Marine Sanctuary to that email address and either Paul or others on our staff um, who are also assisting with this effort will get back to you. We wanna make sure that we are answering any questions that you may have. It's just, that's not the purpose of today's meeting. 
Um, so just to go over some guidelines for the public comment today. Uh, again, we are here to listen to your oral public comment. Um, again, not a question and answer session. Your public comment can of course include anything on the draft designation documents that Paul just described, the proposed rule, the draft management plan and or the draft environmental impact statement. We will be calling speakers in the order in which they registered for the webinar. Speakers will be, as I mentioned earlier, unmuted by us on our end. And then of course, if you've muted yourself, go ahead and unmute yourself as well. But you'll be unmuted to give up to three minutes of comment. We'll be using an on-screen timer that will start at three minutes and count down to zero. So please keep an eye on that as you're giving your comment. As you, as you see the, count, the timer getting closer to zero, please go ahead and start wrapping up your comment. We want to be respectful of everyone on this call and ensure that we're sticking to three minutes for everyone. Uh, if for some reason, though, you run out of time giving your full comment, that's totally fine. You are welcome to then go ahead and upload your comment to in the method that Paul referenced on one of those last slides to the FedRegulations.gov, the, the e-rulemaking website that we are using. So you can certainly go ahead and get your full comment uploaded there. Um, I will be calling several names at a time. I will call the speaker who's up immediately uh, following nice my little speech here. And then I will call one or uh, probably two more names after that just to give folks an idea of when they might be coming up. Um, so when you give your public comment, please go ahead and give your full name. And then also, if you'd like, you can also provide an affiliation if you would like us to know that. Um, you will not be able to give your time to somebody else. You cannot cede time. For groups with the same comment, we ask that one representative from that group or organization provide the comment on behalf of the greater group. You're welcome to state, you know, obviously the, na the, group, the, na uh, the name of the group and even how many members are in that group and representing that, that comment that you're giving. If you have already provided public comment, whether it was at one of the two previous in-person public comment meetings that we held at the end of September, or if you've already submitted your uh, comment in one of the other ways that Paul listed through regulations.gov or by snail mail, um, you do not need to provide public comment again today. Um, your comment, if you've already submitted it already, has been recorded and the staff are reviewing all comments. Um, we do ask, of course, that all commenters be respectful to each other and others' positions when giving your public comment. And again, at, at any time, if you would like to speak and did not register in advance stating such, that's totally fine. Just use the question box and state, I would like to speak, and you will be added to the speakers list. So just one note, we are doing an audio recording of the public comments today, which is strictly for note-taking purposes only. We will not be publicly posting the audio recording. Um, it's really just to ensure that our, note, our two note-takers are accurately summarizing your comments. We are not taking verbatim comments. They are not court, court reporters. Um, they're gonna be furiously typing away to capture the summary of your comment and again, if need be, we can refer back to the audio to just ensure we properly uh, summarized your comments. We will then of course be taking all of the comments from today's meeting and the previous public comment meetings and uploading those summaries to regulations.gov. But if for some reason you really want your specific verbatim comment recorded, you are welcome to go ahead and still submit that to regulations.gov or send it to us via mail. 